Okay, well, hi, I'm Rebecca Olkowski with babyboomster.com. And today I am interviewing Melanie Chardoff, who is an actress and a writer and an all around really interesting person who wrote the book, Odd Woman Out. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that. So <laughs> welcome, Melanie. Thank you, Rebecca, at last. Yes, I know. Um, Melanie, you might remember, uh, was the voice of Dee Dee Pickles in Rugrats. If your children watched that like mine did. Mm. My, that was like my daughter's favorite show. And, uh, and also, you'll know her from the show Fridays, which was like a variety show, sort of like Saturday Night Live, but on a different channel. And she was on that for quite a long time. And she's done a whole lot of other stuff, <laughs> which we'll talk about. So um, what prompted you to write your book? Well, I've been performing these stories for years. I'd um, written, I'd been commissioned to, to write a one woman musical for the Joshua Tree Comedy Festival. So I wrote songs and choreography and a lot of these stories. And um, I had reached a point in my fifties, Rebecca, where I wasn't on camera acting as much. Mm -hmm. And I, I was doing mostly voiceovers. So the element of fame, kind of visible fame, kind of, you know, left my life, the facial recognition factor, except for fans of reruns and things I'd been in before. And I started writing because I had so much more time on my hands. And I began to get such joy out of writing uh, because I had sort of befriended my imagination, uh, which had not been my friend um, for the first half of my life, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that I was able to put a lot of feelings into words that I used to put through my performing body as an actor. And um, I found that the words could do a lot of the heavy lifting, all the singing and dancing used to do. Right. And I started <laughs> selling articles to humor magazines and uh, chicken soup for the soul books. And it seemed like there was a market for my voice. And then um, I could have, you know, walked happily into the sunset with myself in my 50s because I was feeling so much more contentment. But then I met my husband in my 60s and we got married at 65. And whenever I told young career women or men who hadn't found a one or didn't get to have kids, they would say, oh, you give me hope. Yeah. Um, so a lot of folks had given up on, you know, they're having happy lives, but they had sort of given up on having that great soulmate companionship that I was fortunate enough to be finally ready for in my 60s. So we got married when I was 65, a little late, but we started, <laughs> <A little> bit. <laughs> we've embarked okay. on a really great life together. He's a psychotherapist, which is so handy to have around the house. Uh, he can't do anything, he can't fix anything, but he can talk it into getting well. Right, right. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I can relate to you on, on the fact that, you know, because I've worked as an actor for a long time, too, not not quite as well as visible, I guess. But uh, but I know that that whole, you know, the whole industry makes it difficult sometimes to have a relationship. Yeah, because it did. I was doing two series at one time at one point, and I had no time for life. I just had time for sleep and rest and preparation for each of the jobs. Right. Um, because people think we just show up on camera or on the mic, but we're, there's a lot of preparation involved. It's not all glamorous. No, so, uh, not at all. <laughs> I didn't have much of a life. I hadn't traveled. I only traveled for work. And I was ready to have a, you know, my parents hadn't had a happy marriage. So it was very important to me to have a good loving relationship, to have a sense of family, which I had never really had. My family were kind of Teflon for attachment for various reasons. Um, that I go into in the book. Funny, it, it comes out funny in the book, but it was a very painful time, my childhood. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that because the, one of the first scenes in your book that really stood out to me was, and I had mentioned that before when I talked to you, but um, was when your you were sitting and watching television and your, your mother like just stripped off her clothes because your father was watching a, a football and um, I guess it was like a way to get attention, but, I'm like, oh my God, I can't even imagine my mother doing that. <laughs> well, um, my parents had a wacky relationship and my father was gambling. He was betting on, on the football game. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And my mother wanted to interrupt that and get him to come to supper with the three of us. We usually waited till daddy was hungry before we ate. And oh. when he was on the phone with his bookie, he didn't get hungry. He was having such a good time. So she couldn't get his attention. She tried and tried. And finally, she did strip off her clothes and sing Gilbert and Sullivan in front of the television. So he couldn't get the sports scores. And yeah, I will talk about what happened next, but it's kind of wild. Well, um, yeah, then she then he threw her out in the snow, which is yeah. scary. Yeah. I mean, it, it was scary. I mean, she laughed and he laughed like it was funny. So my sense of what was really funny was a little bit twisted. Um, you know, it was blacker than black comedy in our household, but we had to keep laughing because that was the only feeling that we all enjoyed in common. Right, um, right. It kind of got us from being angry. There was sort of an element in, at, in, in, of love and laughing at each other. We mistook lo- laughing for love. I continued to do that when I was in comedy and I would fall in love with the funniest men. <laughs> Even if they weren't good relationship material, you know, they made me laugh. So I thought I loved them. That was yeah. how confusing it was. I know. I always thought I always wanted a funny person, you know, but I, I, I actually didn't end up with two that were tremendously, well, sort of funny, but not, not tremendously funny, but yeah, I was kind of wondered what that would be like, you know, thinking that that was an important part of a relationship. I, I yeah. think it is. Well, I think humor is an important part, but being funny all the time is not as important as I had thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't laughing or punning or breath falling when I was a kid. I was frightened, actually, kind of frightened about the the tension in the air. It was yeah. so boiling. So, and, and then how did that affect you as far as like because it did take you a long time to have a relationship uh, that you felt comfortable enough to get married to I mean I know you had other relationships and stuff but how did that affect that do you think that that had a major part of it right I did I went through different phases with it um you know at the very beginning of the book I have a a story of great resignation that well you know I'm not going to I'm not not going to have kids and probably not going to get married and probably not going to meet the one. Mm -hmm. So I need to figure out what to do with myself. So in the first story, I sort of make some adaptations as recommended by my gynecologist. And then in my later years, I had, you know, the adventures that I didn't have when everybody else was having free love and liberation in the seventies, I was very prudish and I was a virgin for a much longer time. I kind of reached my expiration date in my early twenties, like 23, but I was way beyond the pole date in my era because most women had given up their virginity much sooner than me because they had the pill. The pill made it all okay. Uh, So morality and chastity kind of went out the window but I wasn't ready psychologically for that kind of abandon. So I didn't have it until my fifties. And I had a kind of a wild old time for a while. (laughs) I think we all did. (laughs) It was interesting that you could keep going in your fifties and have kind of a wild time. Then it was kind of long postponed, but it was kind of wonderful. And I I had felt it was biased of me because I'd always been dating, you know, white guys who are a little bit older, a little bit taller Mm -hmm. And I decided that would be biased to not have experienced, you know, other sorts of people, different signs, different heights, different colors. So, right. Yeah. You know, I thought I was uh, late at 19, (laughs) losing mine, but, (laughs) but you also, you know, when you, it seemed like when you had relationships too, you, you, it took a long time before you actually like jumped into bed with them. Whereas a lot of people in the free love era were just like, Oh, okay. You just meet them and jump right in. You know, I, I was too scared. I don't think I ever had an actually deliberate one night stand. I don't, I don't think that was my thing. I needed to be friends, you know, and trust somebody. Yeah. Anything uh, happen, you know, when you're in a room, I guess we've been hearing horror stories during the me too movement of, things that seemed innocent in a hotel room that turned into uh, a terrifying assault. So um, I don't think young women will go off to hotel rooms drunk as much as they used to, not after all the terrible stories about what's been going on over the last millennium. Um, Yeah, I think anybody that worked as an actress, uh, especially early on, you know, in the 70s or 80s and stuff, I'm sure that you probably have a Me Too story to tell, do you? Well, in my book, I talk about a a boyfriend who I'd broken up with, who um, 
couldn't take no for an answer. And I didn't know the word, I didn't know the words for restraining order, you know, in mm -hmm. those days, I don't think they had that. No, they didn't you know? think of, it was a no, big I thing. I never thought of that. And um, so I had a very bad experience in my twenties. And then I had some run-ins, but I had a smart ass mouth, you know, uh, like actors <laughs> and comedians do. And I kind of talked my way off the edge a few times. You know, and I had that encounter like with various uh, well-known actors and celebrities and comedians and stuff. And, you know, it wasn't as assaultive as it could have been, but it was still very uncomfortable. And there was kind of this conflict between my self-righteous indignation and some older man's kind of self-righteous entitlement. You know, there was like this warring point of view. My body was not for him, but they assumed they were entitled to just grab any part of you they wanted. I think that's going to die down now. <laughs> yeah, I think Mario <laughs> Como is feeling it right now. <laughs> yeah, they're really learning their lessons now. So, yeah, I mean, almost it almost gets to the point of you think, well, you know, at least let the guy, you know, defend himself first. But, but yeah. I, I know I remember times, you know, they just people that men, men that were in a powerful, powerful position just felt like they could just do that. Right. And it always stymied women, at least in my generation, we didn't quite know what to say or do. I mean, we hadn't been given permission yet to say, get your hands off me, asshole. We were afraid we'd jeopardize our careers or our social standings or lose the man as a friend. Right. Um, and all those fears. But I think that kind of um, shift to seeing things from the female point of view has occurred during this time. I'm so glad we're alive during this time, Rebecca. Yeah because we are seeing women becoming empowered. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, along with the Black Lives Matter movement, I think women in our industry have really come to the fore. Um, the inclusion has become an entitlement. And um, I think what happened with the Golden Globes recently was, was evidence yes. that we can't just ignore an entire culture anymore that's so much part of America. Right, yeah, I was watching that last night. And then the unfortunate thing is, with that inclusion, there's a lot of exclusion, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of roles that I might have been right for, I'm not reading for. Um, but that's, oh, the yeah. price. that's the price of equality. And that's the price of, you know, civil rights. And um, I'm willing to bite the bullet, you know, and, and let others work and get their viewpoints out as long as they're programming for all of us. Mm -hmm. The thing that concerns me is that um, because of Black Lives Matter, there is a certain assertiveness about Black programming that's exclusionary, I, I feel, to me. The language, uh, I don't understand always the language or what they're saying. I so much want to watch these shows. You're right. I'm getting Emmy-nominated copies of them, but I can't always understand the soundtrack. Now, maybe it's my hearing, but it's also, it's like there's a slight difference in the idiom, you know, in the language. It's a more African-American vernacular. Right, it, yeah, I was having the same problem because I've been, I've been doing all the screenings too, the... Yeah, yeah, SAG yeah. awards and the variety screenings and stuff. And yeah, I was, I was having exactly the same problem. Yeah. So it's not that I don't want to watch this program no. it's that I get lost trying to uh, struggling to understand. And it may just be that the screeners they send us, you know, from SAG and the unions mm -hmm. are not good sound quality. I mean, I considered that too. And so I've complained saying, is this the best sound quality? Is this the best mix? For this particular movie because I want to enjoy it and I'm not able to, to hear it. No, I don't think so. I think it, um, I was watching it on streaming and it was the same problem. And, you know, because I've gotten, I'm just starting to get some of the screeners, but um, on streaming TV, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's it just, uh, I don't know, you know, there were just particular ones where I was like, God, I, like, do I need to turn up the sound to like, you know, as high as possible that I hope they can adjust for that to let us in because we are very supportive, you know, in our unions, we're very supportive of, you know, watching their stories, we want to, we want to understand the language. The, the yeah, story. on the other hand, those shows are so powerful, too. I mean, the one about the um, Judas and the Black Messiah is oh, like a story that most people never heard. No, and the oh the, the the five one night in Miami is wonderful, but I could understand yeah. every word. Those were all theater guys. They were, they, they were. They all enunciated beautifully. I I love that movie. And Regina, Regina King is wonderful. She's a queen. She she was in the Billie Holiday movie. Also, oh, I, was, it was. I haven't seen it. Have you seen that? 
Which one? Billie Holiday, Audrey yeah. Day. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh, that's, I mean, that, you know, I saw the one with Diana Ross and, and that was really good, but this one really delved into areas that we, we didn't hear about before. Right, yeah, so. bravo. And she was very, just right out there. I mean, it was, it was amazing. <laughs> Gotta see it. Um, also, you know, when you t were talking about Me Too, uh, I, you had mentioned a couple of, you know, very, um, you know, favorite TV stars that uh, were doing things that you wouldn't have, have, have expected them to do. Um, like who? Like, like Ed Asner. Oh. I was like <laughs> really surprised about that. Like, you know, yeah. I was like, you know, oh, I no. didn't think I didn't take that didn't traumatize me because we were buddies and we had flirted and, yeah. uh, you know, and he's just such a hero. I mean, I, he's one of my, my most esteemed heroes, but it was just curious because it wasn't just with me that night. It was also with, you know, Marion Ross and yeah. people, uh, not wearing tight dresses. And uh, it was just like, I thought he was going to make a statement about the purpose of flirtation and the purpose of men appreciating women uh, physically. Mm -hmm. But he didn't sum it up in any way that kind of excused him for his behavior that night. And I think 400 people sitting there were just kind of bewildered about, was he trying to say something with these actions? Or is yeah, he just there? There were a lot of things that, you know, people would do that. Because like when I was doing a lot of voiceovers and stuff, you know, we would do some really silly things and get very body and, you know, just make fun of it. And it was just, I didn't really think anything of it because it was... Right. We were just all having fun. We had a sense of humor. I don't know. I think sometimes it almost goes a little bit too far in the way that like, you know, like Al Franken tweaking somebody's boobs who turned out to be like. No, a, no, no. I think he just put know. his arm around her waist and pinched her. Which yeah. Seemed like that atrocious. And I wish he hadn't resigned. I, I think, Me that, too. you know, I th thought we really needed to negotiate around that incident before he gave up his political career because he's so smart, so talented, also funny. Um, yeah. I think we need we need those pundits. Um, but yeah, he was kind of forced to stand down and I thought that would have been an interesting dialogue, you know, a cultural dialogue, slap his hand and let him go back to what he was doing. Right, I, yeah, I think he was just trying to be funny, but I think people, I think, on the, on the one side that people need to be able to get to, you know, defend themselves to, and they, yeah. some of them haven't had a chance to do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so you did a lot of theater and I was like, I was really interested in, in kind of hearing your, you know, getting started and working with people like Peter Brook and the Molinas and, you know, just, because I was kind of into that whole experimental theater thing. I, I worked with UNESCO and, you know. You did? Uh, yes, I did. Where? <laughs> I, I, I did a play in Hollywood called UNESCO's Tales where I played his three-year-old daughter. And they were short stories that he had written um, for his daughter. And so he came to LA and we were doing it at a theater called Stages in um, Hollywood. And he actually wrote a one of the stories while he was there and I was the, I played his daughter. Cool. So that was really, that was like one of my favorite things I'd ever done. I didn't work with Peter Brook. I work with Peter Hall. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so Peter Hall from the Royal Shakespeare Company. That's okay. And, uh, but I met and hung out with Peter Brook um, yeah. as I was my theater critic from college. And I, you know, threw my badge around and got to go to parties with Ben Kingsley and, the whole yeah. cast of Midsummer Night's Dream, which was a, the rocket ship hit of the millennium on Broadway at that time. Peter right. Brooke was, I was just awed by his vision, his gifts, and his ability to see me, to like just take the time to, to take me in was just an honor and kind of a tribute to his just genuine humanity. Right, yeah, it's just exciting to be able to run into people like that, you know, wow, it, during your career. Yeah. <laughs> what was your favorite role that you've ever played? Hmm. I've had such good luck, Rebecca. I, I was in March of the Falsettos, which premiered out here, and I, I got to break in a new song. Uh, this is the wife of a man that's a closet homosexual and who is actually stooping um, his best friend who lives with the family. 
And mm-hmm. I find this out belatedly and my son finds this out and then we all go into therapy. And it's a very neurotic, a funny opera. And I had a killer song called I'm Breaking Down, which is still on SoundCloud. Somebody illegally taped it um, one night. So that was a favorite role. Would love, you know, would love to have done it longer, but it only ran about six months at the Huntington Hartford. I love playing, <laughs> I didn't think I would, but I love playing Miss Musso and Parker Lewis because they began to write to my skills. Mm-hmm. And I became this monstrous, narcissistic, vain bitch. And that was <laughs> so much fun. It was the first time I really got to play, you know, other than uh, Lady Macbeth, you know, in college. It was the first time I really got to play a full-fledged villainess, a funny villainess that people love to hate. <laughs> I love that part. I also love being Prudence in Christopher Durang's play Beyond Therapy, which I toured with in the 80s, in the early 80s. Um And then I played lots of roles and sketches that I would have loved to have developed. Lately, I've been doing readings for a playwright named Eugene Pack, who writes great roles for mature women. Oh, nice. He wrote a play about an aging acting teacher that I would love to do more fully than readings. You know, we do readings for the Actors Fund, a lot of terrific actors pooled together. Mm -hmm. And we try to raise money for donations by doing these free readings on Zoom. So um, some, some of the roles he's written, I would love to develop further. I think especially that aging acting teacher who doesn't realize that business has changed. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how theaters moved on to zoom now. I mean, it's all they can do right now. Yeah. It's, it's the only choice we have. I've been in a number of plays on zoom and you can get into it. You know, it's really like pretend and you can't see the face of the person you're working with right. um, <laughs> without going out of frame, you know, and um, it's, it's a different skill set. But I have found watching some Zoom plays with really good actors who aren't pushing too hard to overcompensate for, you know, it being just a Zoom. I've been in and also seen some amazing work, transcendent work. You know, actors can really work anywhere. All we need is a little light. Just a right. little light. And a few people to listen to us and we give our all. So um, I'm hoping theater comes back. It's my first love. Um, yeah. But still it does, I think we're surviving. You know, a lot of young people come to me and they say, well, what can I do? I'm just starting my career. And I say, you know, shoot a a YouTube or a Zoom or a TikTok with really terrific people, with a good director, with another good actor. Show what you can do or your one minute of best stand-up material. You have to direct it yourself. You have to light it well. Um, You have to make sure it's your best one minute because, you know, as with us, when we audition for things, they tune out. They tune out in the first ten seconds if you yeah. don't grab them right away. So you exactly. have to really get them by the throat in the first few minutes or the few, first few seconds, rather, uh, in order to have impact and in order to keep them tuning in. Well, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of people that have made their careers from YouTube or something like that. Yeah, you know, they just all of a sudden became known and. Um, yeah, it's, it's like you got to know that technology. I think that's one thing that I've been experiencing in, in the voiceover field. You know, it's like now there it used to be that there, the market was in Los Angeles or New York or maybe some some in Vancouver, but now it's everywhere. So it's everywhere. And you There's have to have your own home studio and be an engineer. Yeah, <laughs> like, I had to, you know, overcome. I'm not great at the technology, but I've had to, to learn to do it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and there's so much more competition now, you know, it's not union oh. competition, but people are deciding for the price to go non-union. Uh, so it's a very hard time for us union actors who've been around for a while. It, it is, it, it is. It's almost like you're saying, okay, you go ahead and do that. And if somebody wants me, you know, they can call me. <laughs> I'm just like not going to deal with that yeah. so much. But like you, I got into writing as well. So, you know, it's like a creative outlet. And yeah. that's great that you've been in, been able to be in different publications. And yeah, it's been wonderful. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing so much now. You know, people do talk about writer's block at a certain point, but so far I, I have not had it. I have more ideas wanting to funnel through my small head than, um, you know, I have time for. So um, I'm writing a lot of Corona poetry right now about things that shifted focus during <laughs> one, this strange one year. And did you notice so my, my Corona hair? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, it used to be really dark. Curly. I let it go curly now. It's just so much easier. And um, 
<laughs> you know, and some of my poems are funny and silly and some of them are sad and mournful. Yeah. But, uh, we'll see if there's any interest in that. I don't know. I'm going to see how this book does. People are buying it. I'm getting four and five star reviews, which is good. Oh, it's um, wonderful. It's a great. I, you, know, you have to really sell thousands of books to really be even a blip on the chart. So. Yeah. And you were saying that you had, it started off as a one woman play yeah. and then it became a book. Well, a, an agent saw, you know, I was thinking in terms of performing my material, but she, this agent saw it and she said, no, this is a book. You should really sit down and stop, you know, telling the stories. These are eloquent stories. And she said they had literary value. Oh, yeah. So uh, she sort of forced me to sit down and write the book. And I'm glad she did. It was a discipline. And then as soon as COVID hit, I had it, I had it already placed. So I've been doing nothing but edit it and refine it and, uh, uh, do publicity for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, since then, so I've been fortunate to have something to to do during the pandemic quarantine. You know? And now you said it also it was on audio, right? Because you're oh, an yeah, actor. I, <laughs> I do an audible book. I do all the voices and I do the, some singing in it. And um, yeah, a lot of people are getting the the audible book. It's just a one click on Audible. You know, mm -hmm. you go to Audible. You don't have to subscribe. If you subscribe, you get it free. But if you don't subscribe or you don't want to listen only to audiobooks, you can just hit one click and, and get my audiobook. And it's also an ebook. And it's also, you know, sold at Barnes and Noble and Amazon. Here's my little book. Yeah, you that's did. great. Did you read the book? You read the ebook, right? Yeah, I read it on a, um, it was a PDF version, I guess it was. Mm. Yeah, um, because at the t I think it was right before the audio one. Because I usually like request audiobooks now because the, otherwise I have to sit all the time and I'm trying to get off my butt. <laughs> yeah, it's good to listen while you exercise. Yeah, we do. Actually, I'm, I live with two other women or one lives next door and we're all the same age. So every morning we, we get up in front of YouTube and work out to um, oh, an over okay. 50 exercise thing. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Um, so, you know, I think what, you know, the main part of the book is like finding a, a relationship and you were saying that you finally found one and got married at 65. And that's, you know, I think I would think that somebody that got married that late, you know, you would kind of be, um, used to, you know, your own house and your own things and everything. How does that, how did, how did you make the adjustment to that? Well, you know, um, we didn't move in together right away. You know, we tried it out in small doses. I have a story in there about even sleeping together for the first time, how right. complicated <laughs> that was, because I've been sleeping alone so long, I didn't know how bony I had become and yeah. that I couldn't put my head on his shoulder for like more than a minute. And it was just, uh, it's a very funny story and that I perform in the book, and, on the audio. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it took a while, but I have a large enough house, thank you, Rugrats and Parker Lewis Can't Lose and other royalties, that there's plenty of space between us. I have my own office in the house and he is a therapist. And now that uh, he's not meeting in person with people, he does telehealth from up in the second floor guest house. So we don't see each other all day long. And I thought it would be claustrophobic, you know, uh, us being together so much nonstop. But it's really, we can't wait to see each other in the evening. And uh, it's like Adam and Eve in Eden. You know, we sit out in our yard. We have lawn distance visits with some friends, you know, mm -hmm. without getting too close. So, um, you know, we, we get along pretty good. He's very funny. You know, that really helps. And because I'm an actor and study sort of psychology of people, and as a writer too, I want to understand what makes people tick. And he's a therapist. We have a lot of, you know, interesting conversations, very complimentary interests. Mm -hmm. Also, he was in my improv class for, for a year or two. And oh, he was? Yes, he's oh. hilarious. I had an improv class here at the house in my sort of, uh, I have a two, kind of a two level theater room. Mm -hmm. And um, they were all therapists studying with me. They all needed to go crazy. And they all um, were using, you know, what I call behavioral modification with the improv. I find the improv, when I work one-on-one -on -one with people who are socially awkward and are afraid of being on Zooms or afraid to become the spokespersons for their own work or their ideas or their dating, you know, they're shy. Mm -hmm. um, 
I use improv techniques to get them over the hurdles of overcompensating or shrinking from uh, eyesight or hiding or obfuscating. So I use improv therapeutically a great deal. You know, I could see that because with everybody on Zoom and, and they're conducting all their businesses that way, I mean, people get so camera shy and it's, I mean, there's so many uses for improv that you could use in, in so many different professions, I think. I don't, I, th I owe it everything. I basically started teaching it in college because my acting teacher was an alcoholic and she didn't show up a lot of mornings. So this other guy, Donald and I, I've mentioned him a few times in the book, he's my best friend, started teaching uh, improv games from Viola Spolin's classic book, mm -hmm. Improvisation for the Theater. And, um, and we were big Nichols and May aficionados. So we would act out their albums. Oh, and, wow. Um, yeah, so I was teaching improv while I was, when I was like 19 years old. And then when I came to New York, I taught at the Ansonia Hotel in New York City, which was right near my first apartment at 72nd and Broadway. And Betty Buckley was a student of mine. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> still, still a good friend, but she sort of learned to be more present and more silly mm -hmm. uh, in class, which has served her really well. And, uh, and I studied musical theater interpretation, musical song interpretation with her. So we had a really good exchange going and it's really stood us in good stead as friends. We've been buddies for a long, long time. We both came out here to do series, you know, in the early eighties, she was doing eighties enough and I was doing Fridays. And we, you know, I lived with her at the Chateau Marmont for a while. <laughs> we had all these Hollywood adventures and stuff, but. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah I've been there. I, I threw up there once. <laughs> Oh, I got drunk. Congratulations. <laughs> I was doing a movie and I was with Laura Branigan, who's, you know, um, she was in the movie and I was staying in her, we were all in her suite and I kind of overdid it there. <laughs> oh, it's easy to do there. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, I know a lot of actors even don't don't study improv as much. And I actually didn't, I did more like, I was doing more like Grotowski and, you know, all kinds of. I did that too. Yeah, yeah. stuff like that, but not not as much the improv, even though I had thought about like joining the Groundlings. But I found that I wished I had, because especially if, when you're doing voiceovers, I was doing a lot of dubbing, so I didn't really have to do a lot of it. But when I was doing ADR, um, voila. That, yeah, voila. Yeah, that comes in handy. <laughs> it definitely does. I've improvised on so many shows. You know, and the other thing is that uh, they give the same script to everybody, the same words, mm -hmm. but the behavior is completely improvisational. You know, the words are the lyrics, but we provide the music and, and the music comes out of all of us in a very different way. Right. So I think improv is, is very important as an adjunct, not in place of acting classes. I think acting class, formal acting class, very important. It is, uh, yeah. Improv is a great adjunct. I, I feel very necessary. <laughs> oh, let's see what else. Um, oh, yeah, you were you had mentioned in your book you had accidentally hooked up with a, a guy who was an alcoholic, which was um, I, I related to that because my last relationship was uh, kind of similar. Yeah. Um, except that it lasted a lot longer. <laughs> Lucky <laughs> it didn't last that long, but yeah, it was, he was such an attractive person and he was so manly and mm. um, he, he was my car dealer and, um, you know, he was so masterful in his sales techniques. He just won me over, but I didn't know. I mean, I had, I was raised Jewish and I was not raised, I was raised culturally Jewish. I'm and, like that too. <laughs> yeah. Not religious, not a religious Jew at all. But they were all teetotals in our family. Maybe they have a sip of Manischewitz at the holidays. But other than that, there wasn't much of that around. So I didn't recognize it, you know, in Britain, you know, or in France, everybody had an evening wine or a drink, but I didn't realize what an addict he was. So, Yeah, mine was, mine was similar experience of, of somebody being really charming and winning you over and almost like hypnotizing you. Yes. And then, you know, once you get in deep with them, you realize this person really has a problem and you know? they're not reliable and they can't be counted on for their word. And there's just a lot, a lot of common traits I knew nothing about. And they lie a lot. Yeah. They lie a lot to themselves and everybody else. It was shocking really. Yeah. It's something people have to be really aware of. I think when they 
especially with, you know, when you're dating in later life too, I think people have kind of gotten their habits down, you know, yeah. <laughs> and especially baby boomers who had substance abuse problems to begin with a lot of them. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just, there were so many things in your book I related to. <laughs> And the reason, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I didn't think there was enough conversation about women our age, our sexual experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, there was so much about, you know, the, the Me Too movement and younger women's traumas and challenges. But I don't think we talked about it very much. You know, when we were younger, all the accidental assaults or flirtations or inappropriate behaviors. And I thought it would be good for younger women to understand that this has been going on for many thousands of years and this is how it manifested in my age group. You know, mm -hmm. this is my bewilderment about sex and what's correct and, and love and all that. And, um, you know, my book is not a how to book. It's a how not to uh, <laughs> get married. And I think a lot of women read the book or men read the book and say, no, no, don't do that. Don't say yes to that. No, no, don't go there. Right. And they see me on the precipice of a big red flag you know, being oblivious or choosing to be oblivious because I was so lonely. Yeah. And um, so they, they see the mistake I made. But Erica Young, who write, wrote Fear of Flying, you know, in the mm -hmm. 70s, I think. And that was sort of the most uh, blatant sexual, women's sexual confessional that I had ever read at that time. And yeah. just something about, you know, I only write a book when there is something missing from the cultural conversation. And that was why she wrote Fear of Flying. And that was why she wrote Fear of 50, why she wrote Fear of Dying more recently. And mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, I think this is missing from the conversation, sexual frank frankness from women our age. Yeah, it's no, that's, a, that's a, an amazing subject because I think that, you know, people don't really think of that so much as you get older. I mean, a lot of women just stop doing it and, um, <laughs> I've been a nun for a while. <laughs> I know. Well, especially during COVID, so many of my friends. Are, yeah. It's tough. Yeah, the day the whole dating scene is hard enough. I, my daughter's still trying to. Uh, she's thirty four and she's already trying to freeze her eggs. She thinks she's like too late and all this stuff. And I'm like, no, I didn't. I didn't even start until I was like that age, of, like having children. But um, oh, well, that gives her hope. Yeah. 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 But, but at being an older person, being in the dating scene, um, you know, I think a lot of people are afraid of it. I, I, you know, it's a, it sounds kind of terrifying. Actually, There's just so many more questions you are entitled to ask now, you know, you don't get together with anybody who doesn't have their card to show you online, you know, their COVID one and two shots. Oh, or that, yeah. COVID negative, you know, it's like AIDS negative, COVID negative, you know, you have to have all your papers in order. Right. I think you need to spend a lot of time virtually talking before you actually trust someone enough to take, you know, take your mask off in, in person. Mm -hmm. uh, there has to be a real lot of trust. You have to check out where their pod is at and yeah. how, how reckless they've been. And I think people our age are not that reckless right now. We're too scared. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, ever since the 80s, I think, you know, we, we sort of had that window uh, when we were in our 20s or, or, you know, around there where, you know, you could just do whatever you wanted to. But then once the AIDS crisis hit, it was like it was like a whole new dynamic. Yeah. You know, as far as that's concerned. But then also, even despite COVID, I think women, you know, when you're you're at a certain age and maybe you've gone a long time without having done anything. I mean, the whole thought of it is like, you know, am I going to break or, you know, is it going to fall out or. <laughs> That's what my first story is about the fact that I was, and then the doctor said, use it or lose it, you know, mm -hmm. it was like, well, you just need to keep working it, you know, all aspects of yourself just in case. So you can be ready because life is a lot longer than I thought it would be. Yeah. I never thought I'd live this long. And it looks like I'm going to live a lot longer. So uh, what to do with all this extra lo love and time and sensuality? There's places to use it. So That's true. I hope people will take the chance, but they just also have to have their questions lined up and to spend a lot of time like you and I are right now getting to know each other virtually. Right, right. <laughs> so um, are you, you're still acting? Are you, is, is that still 
are, you're still into doing that, right? I mean, it's oh, not yeah. A, yeah. Oh, I'll always be an actor at heart. I'm acting on the page now, you know, with my writing, but I, I love working with other people, you know, playing mm -hmm. off of other people. It gives you such a variety of responses, which you can't always get by yourself on a Zoom, one way kind of lens thing, you know, you need to have somebody to work off of. And the kind of improvisation I teach really relies on the bodily energy between two people's presences in a room. And uh, I long to get back to that kind of chemistry. And, and, and in, there's presence and then there's prescience. You mm -hmm. get to a point where you know what the person is going to do because you're so tuned in and connected with somebody in an ensemble, you know? So yeah, I look forward to the joy of that again soon, I hope. Yeah, I think what's really kind of cool is that now you've got actors like Helen Mirren and, you know, Meryl Streep. And I mean, there there's, seems to be more roles in a way. I mean, I, there's always been, you know, very few roles for older women, but yeah. it just seems like you've got these women now that are, they're, they're in so many different things. I mean, I know. Uh, Meryl, Diane, uh, Diana Wiest. Yeah, I just um, saw her. In, my in, idol. Oh, did you see her in uh, Let Them Talk? Or Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was scary. Oh, my God. That was I scary. thought it was great. I really no, I mean, it was a great movie. It was, just, it was just like the whole premise of it was so different. Yeah, and I thought Candace Bergen was rocked it. I thought she was incredible. Yeah, um, I, I love her. She's ever done. And Lucas Oh, you know, I was thinking, I'm sorry. I was thinking of um, uh, I Care A Lot. I care a lot. I was getting the, the names mixed. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. What What's that about? That's where um, Rosamund Pike is like a uh, a woman who works she's in a, a director. Yeah, she's yeah, a, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. She gets seniors. Um, she takes over all their assets and sticks them in a home, and then she sells all their assets. So and How did it you was get like to see that. Pardon? How did you get to see that? Um, I saw a screening. I was like a um, it was a no, let's see, did I see it on screen? No, I think I saw it on, on streaming, on oh. a streaming channel. But, you know, it was one, one of what the screening channel? series. Um, I'm trying to remember, I, I probably Hulu, I think oh. it was Hulu. Okay. I'm not sure. I have, my roommate is, she's a, a TV fanatic and she's got all the streaming channels hooked <laughs> up to our TV. So we've got like everything. Oh, great. That's terrific. Yeah. <laughs> I've never, I was a cable person before. I didn't, you know, I didn't get to see all those things. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a difference. <laughs> so uh, are you, I had heard that um, Rugrats was coming back. Are you working on that? No, I'm not involved in the new Rugrats. I'm just the old Dee Dee Pickles. Oh, the, okay. The Rugrats is CGI. It looks very different. Uh -huh. um, I think it looks kind of cool. And it's, focusing mainly on the on the babies um but you know there'll be some adult presence but not as much as there was oh it's too bad yeah but it should be great i'm, I'm sure I, i'm looking forward to seeing it cheryl chase is still playing angelica right and, yeah um, I've, I've worked with her quite a bit um actually a long he, time ago but. he daily still plays my son tommy <laughs> uh, tara strong is not in it right now because the uh, dill is not involved but uh -huh. uh, yeah, so a couple of the people are the same and a lot of us, you know, uh, older, mature characters, there wasn't much for us to do, so. Oh, oh well. <laughs> but you still got those residuals. <laughs> I still got those residuals, thank you so much, yeah. I know, those are great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think this is wonderful. I'm so happy that you were able to do this and, uh, I am definitely, I, I definitely recommend your book, Odd Woman Out, to anybody that is interested in finding some great reading material or, or listen to it on Audible so you can actually hear you perform it. I think that's, that's amazing. That would be great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I appreciate it. It's at barnesandnoble.com, also at amazon.com, if you don't have a grudge against Amazon by now. <laughs> And if people, um, if people send me proof of purchase at my email, playdate444 at gmail.com, then I will autograph a postcard bookmark and send it to them if they give me their address. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, because I can't autograph books right now. It's not, you know, not easy. So anybody <laughs> anywhere in the world can just send me an email to uh, playdate444 at gmail.com with their mailing address and their proof of purchase. And I'll be happy to send them an autograph postcard. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Melanie. Thank you. All right.